Welcome everyone, my name is Paloma Copelo and I'm a project assistant at the OECD's Director of Financial and Enterprise Affairs. Today I'm going to be interviewing Robert Patelano, who's a he Deputy Head of Division, and Caroline Rollet, who's an economist. They both support the OECD's work of the Committee of Financial Markets. They will discuss today key factors that contribute to public trust in markets, in particular some post-crisis developments that have restored public trust, as well as discussing some potential risks that could erode this trust. Rob, perhaps I shall start with you. Um, why is trust in financial markets of particular importance, and what are the key factors maintaining trust in markets? Sure, thank you, Paloma. So let me talk about um, our, uh, our chapter on markets. Uh, in terms of trust, there's a duality to it. So we're trying to show that investors are investing in markets, of course, to um, to put their savings and investment to good use to economic growth. So we want to see sustainable and inclusive economic growth, and ideally that has a, a, a positive impact on the markets as well. Growth leads to better market returns, and of course those better market returns give pre predictability to investors, and investors uh, reward that by re-engaging with the market. So there is a virtual cycle that actually supports sustainable growth. And of course in order to do that, what you need to, to um, as a foundation for sustainable growth is the right oversight uh, regulation and of course attention to financial stability. So getting the policy right is really important for maintaining that trust in markets. Uh, and then uh, I would say that the framework that we're using to better understand um, how the markets function and the importance of trust is this. There are three prongs to it. The first has to do with um, the predictability of returns. So there's an economic value component, which I mentioned in terms of trust. The second has to do with in, uh, integrity and fairness in markets to make sure that the, um, the rules of engagement are perceived to be fair, which also brings, brings players to the table to put their money to work. And then the third element above and beyond these two is actually ethics to make sure that the markets themselves and the behavior of all the participants is broadly aligned with, with societal values. And I think ethics is a good uh, example of that. Uh, so those, those are the three. And then we're going to cover across, uh, across our chapter three elements. Uh, Caroline will first talk about markets and debt. Uh, I will talk about markets and market-based intermediation. And then lastly, we'll talk about financial innovations. Thank you very much, Rob. So you mentioned uh, global markets intermediation of sovereign and corporate debt. Caroline, turning to you now, can you describe shortly what are the key developments and risks that could erode trust? Sure, thank you very much, Paloma. Uh, indeed, over the last decade, with highly accommodative monetary policies, stocks of sovereign and corporate debt uh, has grown substantially, um, now standing at historically high levels in many advanced and emerging economies. Also, markets for contingent uh, convertible bonds uh, in banking uh, have grown uh, considerably. The outlook is highly dependent on economic credit and market conditions, and major concerns relate to the sustainability of the debt. Indeed, uh, high leverage and slowing economic growth may trigger rating downgrades and defaults and also increase credit risk premium and financing costs. This may erode um, the resilience of many debt holders, such as banks, institutional investors and asset managers. Also, it may erode uh, public uh, trust in post-crisis policies and intermediaries. For example, a societal concern may arise regarding current insurance and pension plans. Also, uh, corporate defaults may increase unemployment and worsen uh, credit financing for SMEs uh, that may exacerbate economic downturn. Should this occur, some countries would face rising fiscal costs and also uh, central bank monetary policies would be pushed further toward the lower bound. Thank you, Caroline. Perhaps a second phenomenon in financial markets in the post-crisis area is the rise of the market-based finance. Rob, could you please describe key developments and potential impacts on trust? Yes, yeah, so um, leading on from uh, Caroline's points on debt, I think it's important to note that in post-crisis environment for the past 10 plus years, you've seen a lot of this debt transition outside of banks, outside of lending, to parts of the uh, markets that are called market-based finance, and primarily that would be open-ended funds, it would be securitization products, 
such as CLOs, which we will talk about, collateralized uh, loan uh, obligations. And um, I should say, first of all, that overall market-based finance, as an alternative to bank finance, provides a lot of benefit. It provides financial inclusion. It provides choice to, to financial uh, consumers in terms of where they want to put their money. It can provide enhanced returns or risk-adjusted returns. So we see this overall as a benefit. However, when it's coupled with debt and when it's moving into less liquid markets, we have a bit of a, a, bit of a concern where that lack of liquidity on the asset side is paired with open-ended funds. So investors, maybe we are investing in these open-ended funds and we're able to get our money out at any given day. However, on the asset side, if there's less liquidity and we're pulling our money out, then of course the funds are obliged to sell assets. And when we do this collectively, under some circumstances, it could be the case that that puts pressure on asset prices in certain markets, and that can have negative spillovers. And what I mean by that is when, when investors see that the prices are going down, they're not sure whether there is a concern, a fundamental concern, and they pull their money out as well. And then it has a similarity uh, in, in terms of a run, right, to a bank run. So investors are pulling money out, a lot of selling on the market. So there's a bit of concern. And as a result of that, we think that there should be uh, some policies that are put in place to make sure that there is a reinforcement of trust and a reinforcement of mechanisms so, so it minimizes this type of risk. Thank you, Rob. One of the prominent developments over the last decade is certainly the rise of financial technology, or fintech. Mm -hmm. Could you please discuss some key innovations and what are the implications they will have for public trust? Sure. So fintech or financial technologies, I'm sure many, many people have heard this in the financial press, uh, is the use of technology in the financial space to, um, to make some processes more efficient. And certainly blockchain is one element of that. That has many benefits uh, from, from security to efficiency to, to trust in and of itself. And that's being used underpinning many of the processes that we're saying in financial technologies. And as it's being applied to elements of finance, uh, there, of course, are benefits. However, with any new technology, with any emerging technology, there are risks. And likewise, some of the regulators may not be up to speed in terms of monitoring and managing those risks in an appropriate way. So the two examples that we lay out in our uh, publication have to do first with high frequency trading and algorithmic trading, and second, they have to do with crypto assets. So in terms of the high frequency trading, uh, you can imagine that that high frequency at lower price, all else equal, is very good for, for those who are trading, and it's good for markets overall to absorb new information. Uh, however, what we've seen over the past decade is there are increasing incidents of so-called flash crashes, where there are incidents that happen in the market and that market players pull back very quickly. And uh, that, on occasion, is being driven by high-frequency traders, algorithmic traders. And luckily, so far, it has not led to broader crises in this era of uh, very liquid um, markets because of monetary policy. However, in a less, uh, a less accommodative monetary environment or with deteriorating credit conditions, we may see something very different play out that may have more consequences. So we want to alert policymakers that now is the right time really to be focusing and to, to improving the system, the resilience of the system, so that when they do face more difficult times, that the high frequency trading doesn't lead to such risks that could undermine trust. Thank you very much, Rob and Caroline, for your explanations. Now, turning to what policymakers can do to address this risk Rob just mentioned and help safeguard resilience in public trust, Caroline, perhaps starting with you, can you discuss some policy recommendations regarding fixed income markets? Sure. Uh, indeed, uh, authorities with systemic risk oversight should give further attention uh, to that build up in their financial stability assessment. Uh, in addition, they also uh, should more formally link uh, systemic concern to the stance of monetary policy. In the case of corporate debt, because there is no public oversight, communication about risk by central authorities is crucial. Uh, and a greater use of early warnings may help assess potential risk and accurate pricing. Uh, regarding public debt, uh, minimizing funding costs and refinancing risk are the main challenges. 
and also with rising market-based finance, further regulatory oversight uh, should be necessary, uh, notably uh, regarding loans granted by investment funds or pension funds, or also structured products such as CLOs. Rob, what about market-based finance and financial innovations? Sure. So in terms of market-based finance, I've talked a bit about funds and about some of the liquidity risk of funds. Luckily, in this space, a, a lot of good work has been done by international bodies, so the Financial Stability Board and IOSCO, an organization of securities regulators, have done a lot of work to try and uh, strengthen liquidity risk management policies, uh, at least on paper, uh, for national authorities, national regulators, to take on board and apply to asset managers. I think the challenge that we have is that 10 years after the crisis, the implementation of those policies is still, uh, let's say, at an early stage and certainly uh, not consistent across jurisdictions. And we think that given that there is an opportunity for regulatory arbitrage for some large funds to move into those areas where there are, there are the least amount of regulation, having some consistency and some minimum standard of application of these policies would be very important. So we're really focusing more attention in that area. And also we think that if authorities want to have systemic stress uh, communication that they need to they need to um, do that based upon the right systemic um, stress uh, analyses in their own jurisdictions and that needs to incorporate liquidity and this is a fairly new field this has happened in credit it's happened with respect to operations but we really want to focus on this liquidity risk analysis so that bodies from national authorities to international organizations including our own report are actually expressing concerns over the liquidity and fixed income markets. And I think if we can put all that together in our, in our report the way that we have and communicate that to policymakers, to investors, to the public at large, that this understanding will help build awareness for the need for resilience in financial markets. And that awareness helps engage policymakers to take action and ultimately to build trust in the system. Thank you very much, Robert and mm -hmm. Caroline.